morning, everyone, and welcome this morning to Shepherd of the Hills. Welcome to everyone who's joining us online on this blessedly rainy morning. Thanks be to God. Um, when I woke up, oh, I think it was Friday night into Saturday morning at some ungodly hour, and uh, I couldn't quite hear if it was raining. And I mean, this didn't do anything for me getting back to sleep, but I ran to a window and opened it, and yes, it was raining. And I've, I've never, oh, it's been a while since we've, we've experienced it, and um, it's a version of manna from heaven. Truly, it is. We're so very thankful. Today in our gospel lesson, Jesus will be talking about who is the greatest, right? And the words great and greatest and so on, those get thrown around so easily. And I think that we can be lured into ideas of what that means without thinking about maybe a little bit deeper. And Jesus is going to take us to a very different kind of great today. So uh, just a bit of a preview there. Uh, we want to begin our worship, as we always do, with a time of quiet, a time of coming into this place together and acknowledging God's presence around us, surrounding us, and holding us. I invite you to rise as you are able as we join beginning worship in our confession and forgiveness this reminder of being honest about ourselves being a broken people but also assured constantly of God's love and forgiveness blessed be the Holy Trinity one God whose teaching is life whose presence is sure and whose love is endless Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. And our gathering hymn this morning, All Are Welcome, on page 22 in your bulletins, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 5. Verses 1, 2, and 5. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition, that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we hear from God in scripture, preaching, and song. The first lesson this morning is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. My child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you indeed cry out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it, as for hidden treasures. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth. Come now, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk blamelessly, guarding the paths of justice and preserving the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path, for wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Prudence will watch over you, and understanding will guard you. It will save you from the way of evil, from those who speak perversely, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, those whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. The word of the Lord. Thanks. The psalm this morning is Psalm 1, and I will read the fine print, and if you would please read the bold. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither, and everything they do shall prosper. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. The second reading this morning is from the book of James, chapter 3 and chapter 4. And yeah, chapter 3 and 4. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where did they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. 
you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. The word of the Lord. I invite you to rise as we welcome the gospel with our gospel affirmation. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first, must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it into his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And as it usually happens, when I carefully prepare a children's sermon, we have no children. But I'm going to go ahead and share this with you anyway, and with our folks um, at home, because I think it's, I think it's pretty important. Um, so we've spent some time um, sprucing up the church while we've been uh, during the pandemic. Um, we have painted and done over the fellowship hall, uh, one of the bathrooms, working on the other one. Well, one of the things that Patty and I are looking for right now are new entry mats for the doors, right? Um, they've been around for a while and we're looking for new ones. So I got onto Amazon, the place where all the things are, and I found some doormats, and I'm not sure that they're right. And so if I had the kids here, I know that they could tell me which ones were right. So this was the first one that I found, and it says, Please don't let the cats out, no matter what they tell you. <laughs> well, that doesn't work here because we don't have cats here. Uh, the second one that I found was, just so you know, there's like a bunch of dogs in here. Those of you with a bunch of dogs might want to think about that. But again, that doesn't work here, right? Then I found one that was kind of interesting. It says, come in. We are awesome. Okay, that's a contender, right? But then I found one that I thought might just be something to think about. 
and it has a very pretty border around it, and it says, welcome, just welcome, right? It doesn't try to, you know, tell people who we are, just welcome, come in. You are treasured and loved and welcome in this place. And I wonder um, if Jesus were the one picking out the doormats. I mean, it depends if he, Jesus has a sense of humor, right? He might pick one of the others. But I feel like he would pick this one. That he would pick one that says welcome at every door into our church. And I also thought Jesus might get even a little more creative. Jesus might put a welcome mat right in front of the font. And Jesus might put a welcome mat right in front of the table so that we all know that we are all welcome in this place. As we sang this morning, all are welcome. So welcome mats, something to think about. Dear people of God, grace to you and peace this day from God who cares for all through Christ who is sent to embody that care and love. Amen. Who is the greatest? Who gets to decide who is the greatest? And how many of you thought that this story sounded a whole lot like road trips, either in your youth or maybe in early parenthood, when the kids are arguing about who knows what in the back seat, generally eliciting, if you don't stop, I'm turning this car around, right? Uh, Jesus probably very likely overheard everything they were saying. He did not say, I'm going to turn this walk around. Rather, he asked them a question. He opened up this opportunity for them to fess up and to own what they had been saying. That didn't work, right, because they've been caught red-handed. And Jesus, as is the, the habit of a teacher, uses this as a teachable moment. And of course, the lesson he teaches isn't what they're expecting to hear from him. And this is becoming very typical with Jesus, right? Just when you think you know what he's going to say next, he switches gears. But with this switching of gears, there, there is a bit of gravitas with it because he sits down. And in the Jewish tradition, when the rabbi is going to teach, the rabbi doesn't stand up here. The rabbi sits down. It's, it's almost like Luther's table talk where the really serious stuff needs to happen sitting down. So this is a signal to the disciples, OK, this is important. Y'all need to gather around and listen up. And this wisdom that Jesus gives them is wisdom for the ages, the likes of which are revered across literature and the arts, historical accounts, sacred texts. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Now, in this short phrase, really is contained wisdom of such a degree. And I can't think of a situation in life where, if applied, it could make such a big difference. Last of all and servant of all. And with this teaching, Jesus is also making it clear to his disciples that greatness and power in the reign of God aren't things that are attained through oppression, power, class distinctions, or any kind of wealth or fame. But they're instead demonstrated through lowliness and servanthood. It's demonstrated by meeting people where they're at, listening to their stories, and helping them to know that they are seen and heard and loved. This is at the core of the practice you may have heard about called servant leadership. And while that might sound like just the latest business trend, there have been many, many examples across all industries 
where when the CEO or the leader adapts to that kind of leading, things change mightily for the whole organization. When I think about servant leadership, the very first picture that comes into my mind is our presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton. And in particular, at the ELCA Worship Jubilee in Atlanta in 2015. We had just had our first big Eucharist. There were maybe eight, 900 people there. And this was at the Episcopal Cathedral, so there was this reception afterwards in one of their big rooms. And we were all beginning to straighten up towards the end of the reception, and Bishop Eaton was helping us out. In the center of the room was this beautiful big floral arrangement, and the folks at the cathedral said, would you like to take this home? Which was a wonderful gesture, but would have required a forklift to pull off, right? And then Bishop Eaton said, well, you know what we could do is we could take it apart and put it into bouquets for our keynote presenters. And so we began to do that. She is in the middle of, you know, helping us with all these things, and she pulls a snapdragon stem out of the uh, arrangement, and she said, do you know you can make these things talk? And she pinches the back of the snapdragon and makes it into a puppet like so many of us have done. And one of my favorite pictures that I have on my phone is of Bishop Eaton carrying a case of beer with a snapdragon stem in her mouth, like a flamenco dancer with a rose. And this way that she leads by serving drives her staff nuts, right? She doesn't have a calendar that really allows for this kind of interaction, but they have learned that this is who she is. And her ministry is defined by getting into the trenches with folks and serving alongside them. That's who she is. And the other picture that comes to mind is that of Aaron Feuerstein. He was the owner of Malden Mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts. This is the mill that invented Polartec, right? This lightweight insulatory fleece that revolutionized outdoor wear. In December 1995, a fire destroyed most of the mill that employed about 3,000 people. Now, common business practice, both then and now, would have seen nothing wrong with Mr. Feuerstein taking the insurance payout and retiring. He turned 70 on the day of the fire. But for Mr. Feuerstein, that was not what was going to happen. He was going to rebuild. Because as he said, this is part of this town. This is part of these people's lives. And in the time that the rebuilding was happening, he continued to pay every one of his workers and he covered their health care for six months. He's an Orthodox Jew, and his whole way of being was informed by Torah, by the Book of Law. You are not permitted to oppress the working man because he's poor and he's needy amongst your brethren and amongst the non-Jew in your community, said Feuerstein to an interviewer. But he was distressed by the amount of attention that all of this brought. He said, I got a lot of publicity, and I don't think that speaks well for our times. At the time in America of the greatest prosperity, the god of money has taken over as an extreme. His dedication to caring for and serving his workers and his community eventually cost him that company as mounting debt and overseas production by his competitors pretty much undercut his entire market share. Nice guys don't finish first. But he was unrepentant. He felt that he had done the right thing throughout in paying his workers and rebuilding. And Mr. Feuerstein is still alive at age 96, living with his kids and grandkids and thinking he did the right thing. Jesus turned to that same book of Jewish law. Compare what Mr. Feuerstein did to the usual picture that we saw of CEOs gutting a company, making off with millions, and leaving their workers in the dust. That book of Jewish law to which he turned is the one to which Jesus turned you must be last of all 
and servant of all, because that is how you cultivate a life worth living, and that is how you truly become greatest of all. Jesus then continues to this striking object lesson of placing a child in the middle of the circle of disciples and telling them, by welcoming a child, you welcome me and the one who sent me. By welcoming a child, you welcome God. Children in Jesus' time, of course, had no worth other than his property. They were expendable, as were women. It's notable that Jesus went out of his way to include women and children in his traveling, his teaching, his feeding, and healing. And I wonder if we might say today, well, we're better than that. We treat our children really well. That is absolutely true here at Shepherd of the Hills. Even if the pandemic has curtailed our ability to have Sunday school or confirmation or a whole bunch of other things for kids, we do care about children, not just those who come to church. Our Three Squares program is such a deep example of that, this commitment that the kids in this county who are hungry will not go home without food. But if we look broader, if we look at how the United States as a nation treats its children, the picture is far bleaker. The statistics been about the same since I first heard this statistic 30 years ago. Basically, one in four children in this country live in poverty. One in four. Of course, this has fluctuated a bit during the pandemic. Sometimes it's been a little better with assistance, and sometimes it's been worse. And as you can imagine, for children of color, it is far worse. In the pandemic, we are faced with this distressing situation of people demanding that their children not wear a mask at school, even though these children can't yet be vaccinated and the disease variant is running rampant. And while some might call this a political issue, I would have to disagree. I see this as a moral issue and one to which Jesus speaks directly in this lesson. In Jesus' worldview, children have equal worth to that of any other human being. They are to be loved and guided, taught and treasured, and protected. This past week, testimony was given in the U.S. Senate by some very brave young women. Theirs was a shared experience in which they were not loved or treasured or protected, but rather were horribly abused. These young women are U.S. World and Olympic gymnastic champions. And yet, they had come to the U.S. Senate to testify in an ongoing investigation as to why, when credible allegations were brought about abuse happening on the U.S. gymnastics team, no action was ever taken until these young women got an attorney of their own and pursued it on their own. Reports had been made not only to local authorities, but to the FBI, and nothing happened. It is shameful beyond words. As Nelson Mandela said, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. Every organization that supposedly helped and supported them did nothing of the kind. But these young women refuse to take no for an answer. For the last six years, they have fought against a system that has put them down, that has silenced their voices, a system that saw them as expendable fodder to win medals so that privileged people could continue to retain that privilege. Simone Biles stood up in front of that Senate and said, what is a little girl worth? What is a child worth? Can you even put a price on that? And why would you not go to the ends of the earth to protect a child? They never let up their struggle while continuing to train 
and compete and win on a world stage. What Jesus is saying to us here today is simply this. They shouldn't have had to do that. And we can do so much better. The ways of the world are based on power and oppression and greed. But the ways of God are not based on, but rather are love. And all the ways that love is fully embodied, all the giving and loving, healthy and fulfilling ways. From becoming least and servant of all to welcoming the most insignificant person you can imagine. Because practicing these things leads us to see God in these things. And that is replete with a joy that God through Christ aches for us to experience. The experience of helping, of serving, of being least, and seeing someone else be blessed in that time. In this experience that God aches for us to have, we will know who is truly the greatest. Amen. Our song of the day this morning is such a beautiful and beloved Swedish hymn, Children of the Heavenly Father. It's on page 24 in your bulletins, and I invite you to rise as you're able. together in our profession of faith on page five in your bulletins. We belong to the creator in whose image we are all made. In God we are breathing, in God we are living, in God we share the life of all creation. We belong to Jesus Christ, the true icon of God and of humanity. In him God is breathing, in him God is living. Through him, we are reconciled. We belong to the Holy Spirit, who gives us new life and strengthens our faith. In the Spirit, love is breathing. In the Spirit, truth is living. The breath of God always moves us. We belong to the Holy Trinity, who is one in all and three in one. In God, we are all made. In Christ, we are all saved. In the Spirit, we are all united. Together, we belong to the earth, our common home. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Amen. 
Let us gather our prayers together as we pray our prayers of the people. <clears throat> Made children and heirs of God's grace, God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of community, we pray for the church around the world. Unite us in our love for you. Help us overcome our divisions that we are encouraged to work together for your sake. Lord, in your mercy. God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth. Awaken us a new desire to care for this world and empower us to support agencies, organizations, and individual efforts to heal our environment. Lord, in your mercy. God of cooperation, we pray for nations of the world embroiled in conflict. Inspire leaders to listen to each other and work towards peaceful solutions to disagreements. Protect the vulnerable, especially children, who cannot find safety in their home or country. Lord, in your mercy. God of comfort, we pray for all who live with mental or physical illness. Help them find appropriate care. Bring healing and wholeness when the path forward seems bleak. We pray particularly today for all we hold close naming them either aloud or in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God of compassion, we pray for the young people of this congregation. Renew in us your call to welcome the children in our midst. As they grow, strengthen their faith and our commitment to them. Lord, in your mercy. God of consolation, we give you thanks for our loved ones who have died and pray for all who grieve today. Shine your grace on all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to share that peace with one another in a safe way. And those at home, I invite you to bring bread and wine or other juice to the table for the meal. <laughs> Just as a reminder, the offering baskets are in the back so that we can minimize contact. And those of you uh, joining us online, um, you can go to our website to uh, find giving options um, that you might support the work of this congregation in the world. Thank you for your stewardship. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert 
and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to rise that we might give thanks. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, holy God, source of healing and life. You created wholeness. You set your tree of life in the center, enlivening the barrenness, breathing spirit across the dust. You saw our brokenness and planted once again in the center the tree of life, the cross from which Christ rose to save and heal us. You reclaimed wholeness. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and he gave it for them all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy and generous God, we remember Christ's life and death, his resurrection and ascension, which renew the face of the earth. We give back to you what you have given us in creation, bread and wine, grain and grape, we wait for Christ to come in glory. Shape us together in this earth, in the soils and rivers, in the sunshine and wind, in animal and human faces. Send your spirit that we may share your bounty with the whole creation. Help us cry out with one voice. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And we pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God now and forever. Amen. All who hunger and thirst, come, the table is ready. Please be seated. For communion, we distribute with individual pieces of pita bread. There is gluten-free in a cup in the center. The trays contain cups of wine on the outside and white grape juice on the inside, so that all will know that all are welcome to Christ's table. I would invite those assisting to come forward.
Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And just a few announcements before we send and bless into this week. A reminder that we are participating with the Methodist Church on a redo of one of the rooms at the, uh, at the emergency shelter, uh, not the winter warming shelter, but the emergency shelter. Um, looking for furniture, uh, donations, as well as um, some folks to do, to paint the inside of the room. Probably would take about a morning at the most. Um, and uh, would love to get a group together on that. Um, this coming Sunday, November, or November, let's not push this. <laughs> uh, September 26th will be Native American Sunday, our 27th annual, is that right, Marva? Um, uh, celebrating the ties that we have as congregation to the tribes of this area and to the Native peoples, um, experiencing words and music um, with more of a Native American, either a base or origin, um, and we'll also be utilizing a new translation of the New Testament that is in a First Nations uh, idiom. Um, really beautiful text that we've been finding in this, so um, encourage you to be with us next week as we um, celebrate that, as we come together for that. And then the following week, October, Third, yes, October 3rd, will be St. Francis Day. And we will, of course, sing the prayer of St. Francis, and we will think about, as we conclude our season of creation, what does it mean to care for the creatures of this earth, to care for animals and fish and insects and so on. Um, so we want to uh, point that up. Saturday, October 2nd, I will be down at the farmer's market at the waterfront, rain or shine, to do animal blessings. Um, we found that bringing animals into enclosed spaces does not work very well, so we'll be down there where it's nice and open, lots of parking, and uh, a chance to um, have your little, your, your pets receive a blessing, not necessarily little. Um, there are all sizes, all shapes. Um, we just ask that dogs be leashed and all other animals be in a carrier or container of some kind, so as to avoid a free-for-all. Uh, that would just, I've, I've been in situations where everything is just out of control and we want to keep everyone safe, of course. Um, uh, the school bags are continuing, is that right, Kathy? Um, see, Kathy Gaynor, if you um, would like to either contribute or be a part of assembling school bags that are sent out for Lutheran World Relief, that need continues on, onward constantly all over the world, um, so that need is is for sure. And um, as we look forward into the rest of um, the fall, we will be beginning to make some plans um, for our Advent and Christmas time. I know it seems far off, but we all know that's not true. <laughs> and uh, we are sure hoping to be able to bring back some of the traditions that we've enjoyed as a congregation. Um, and uh, welcome any kinds of help or ideas that folks would have around that. I uh, want to say also a special word of thanks to everyone who has helped this summer, uh, the spring and summer around the church, either inside uh, helping with some uh, renovations or outside helping with landscape. Um, it has made a big difference. And if you've not yet had a chance to visit the Peaceful Park in memory of Roger and Joanne Lembrick, uh, please take it, uh, some moments to do that as well. And I think that is enough announcements. Does anyone have any that I've missed? All right. Then let us stand and bless and send into this new week. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. In the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. And are sending him this week, God of the fertile fields, is on page 26 in your bulletins, and it's to the tune um, that is known as Italian hymn, but you'll recognize that. God of the Fertile Fields. <laughs>
peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And thank you all online for joining us this week. Have a good week.